Thank you enormously to Peter for that talk and also um, for, I think, raising many valid issues. It's hard instantly to respond, I have to say to some of it, because I didn't have the advantage of seeing it in advance. And also I had some things prepared, so I'm going to try and weave my way through a little bit of prepared stuff and, and also some responses. Um, but maybe, maybe I can respond at a certain level, because I don't think I can respond to everything. But one thing I can respond to, I think that in your talk you raised almost as much as Rolando the problems of the modern. So there is no question for a start that the modern was not, is not a subject of discussion. And it seems to me, and I'm going to now be polemical, that the difference is communism. The difference between us is whether or not the communist possibility can be rescued from the modern while keeping the modern in place, or whether the demodern gesture, which I will try and talk about, is the one that will release from under the scab of modernity, which covers the wound of coloniality. By removing that scab, you might release the potential that I think, in comradely dialogue, we both want. And I think that for me, the gesture of the demodern is to scratch that scab, not to ignore it. It's to try and find a way in which what is underneath that, which is the barbarity of coloniality, can be seen for what it is in the place. And we have to admit, however much we want to avoid essentialisms about Europe, we have to admit that there is a stretch of the world that starts somewhere in the Algarve, and then somewhere a bit north of where I'm from, in the Shetland Islands, and goes along that West European seaboard of the Atlantic. And that part of the world has been responsible for certain actions in the world. And if we don't accept that there's a certain responsibility in that part of the world, and that we are living in that part of the world, I think we're always going to escape the idea of being in a place. When Gita started and talked about speaking from India, and said, I apologize, I'm not being essentialist, I'm not being nationalist, let me apologize for speaking from Western Europe, from that place, which is a place, as Steve Staben kindly said at the beginning, a place and not the place. And a place with its own particular histories, with its own particular struggles, with its own particular agonistic relationships. And let us not mess about with its own internal colonial, colonialisms and colonialities, with its own conditions in which as Rolando has spelled out, languages, cultures, societies have been oppressed in the name of coloni colonialism, perhaps. But, you know, I have, uh, I have some kind of connection to Scotland, I'm not sure what it is. But, you know, that, that connection is not an easy co connection in relationship to colonialism. It's not simply to only be the colonial, which of course the Scots were, many, notably in India. But also, there were subjects of Anglo-colonialism, of disciplining, of Celtic traditions of the more or less destruction of the language in the 19th century, not so long ago, in the 19th century. So those things I think have to be talked about when we talk about the modern and talk about the relationship between here and there, between the colonial and the colonizer. And they have to be talked about by us. Because if, we, if we're not going to talk about it, who can? And I think that talk is the possibility of being in comradely, but also to some extent in humble or modest dialogue with the issues that Gita has raised. Now I'm going to, I could go on too long here, so I'm going to try and go back to um, something else that Gita said, and maybe, maybe, maybe to give you a little bit of background, because what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about the museum rather than to be so abstract. Um, so I'm going to do a what if, which is a very modern technique, as you pointed out, but maybe a more well, what if that this is well, to the, to the, um, the off-modern or the qualified modern. Let's call it the qualified modern. Let's say that we're all talking in different ways about the quali a qualification to the modern. And therefore there is something which is called the modern which does not need qualified, and maybe we should try and identify that as being the problem, yeah, so that we can qualify it. I'm not into postmoderns and outer moderns and things like that, but they're also qualifications of this core term. So I'm going to do a what if, I'm going to do an off-modern. And I'm going to talk about the history of this museum. This is a bit tricky for me because it's about my predecessor, but I think it, 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 it offers a, an interesting what-if possibility. Um, 
In around 1986, Yandeba, who was my predecessor, was invited to join uh, with Jean Hubert Martin, Marc Francis, and Jean Paul Maubon in a project which later became Magician de la Terre, opening in 1989. Actually, interestingly, Magician de la Terre was the replacement for the Paris Biennale, which it, which it, uh, um, which it superseded briefly. And the Paris Biennale was meant to be in 88, and that was going to be it. And then they realized, oh, it's 200 years since we had some revolution in Paris, isn't it? We better do something about that. So it got all displaced as to, that, to uh, 1989, 1789 being French, rubbish, and, uh, and became Magician de la Terre, and the Paris Biennale uh, never, never recovered, let's say. It appeared in, in, in very different uh, strange forms, including through Stephen Wright and uh, Brian Holmes, but never really recovered its previous position. So there is a relationship to Biennales, but I think that the Magician de la Terre is, is an important moment. Now, Jan Debat was asked to be part of the team, and the sad thing is that we, we, we aren't able to have a, a discussion with him about it, but I have talked to, um, or we have talked to uh, jean Bert Martin about it, and he had this comment about, about Jan, which I think is is very relevant. He said, among the curators, Francis uh, Malbon and Debout, of the small team that I had built to reflect on the exhibition's concept, he was the most reluctant, or at least the one who found it harder to conceive it. He was orderly minded and rather Cartesian. He was not able to connect Western contemporary art and exotic artists, exotic in inverted commas. He was mainly concerned with finding links between those two groups. Also, he used to insist on the need of selecting Western artists, having relations with other cultures. His wish was, I'm sure, and this is in an informal email, so it's not a sort of a big statement, but his wish was, I'm sure, that every magician de la terre artist was a sort of Nam June Pike. An artist who was from there came here and negotiated those two. The more the project went on, the more he took a distance, while the other two curators participated in the mounting phase, he did not. So my what ifs are, my what ifs are in a way two. One big what if is, of course, what if Jan Debat had embraced Magician de la Terre? He was the only, of the only one of those four to be in charge of a collection. He was the only one of those four to be in charge of a museum. So it's possible to speculate a what if of the Van Aber collection that would be completely different, purely as a speculation. But also think about the critique of Magician de la Terre. Think about how problematic magician and that just in response to the kind of modernities which happened outside of the European core. Magician and that as an exhibition, represents, I would say, at least the need to qualify modernity in a very different way, and perhaps even a demodern process of thinking about how that European modernity was preserved in the mirror of the primitivism of outside of Europe. I'm talking to both of you here. <laughs> um, but um, again, in, in, in comradely dialogue, I'd, I'd like to think that therefore, if Jan Debat had gone the other path, we would have had another huge problem. Because we would have had a problem that exactly that question of the modern elsewhere would not be represented in the collection, even if the elsewhere was represented in the collection. <coughs> And this is all really leading up to say that the, the histories that we are making here, the demodern, which I, in a way I want to also to allow the exhibitions, the making of modern art, the way beyond art, to speak for. Yeah, I think that they are an attempt to try and capture in three dimensions, in the bodily experience, which is necessary, the idea of the demodern. So I think that they speak to this idea of the demodern, as well as me. It's not only a rhetorical device, I think it's also a means of making exhibitions. We can say that exhibitions are rhetorical, of course, but nevertheless, they're a different kind of rhetoric than the rhetoric of this. And I think that those exhibitions are also important to understand within this concept of what we talk about as the demodern. I'm not getting, how long have I got? I haven't got to... 10 minutes. <laughs> I haven't even started, you realize that. Um, so the reason I bring these two up is because either way that Jan Debat would have turned would have produced problems. Just as either way that we turn would produce problems. There is an option, the option to some extent which he chose, of saying that he could not connect Western contemporary art with the other, with the exotic. 
And therefore, and this is an option, an option that I use in respect to decolonial theory, an option which allows the museum to try and in perhaps in a modest way, perhaps with less arrogant ignorance, um, so in a good way, to defend Western culture and the Western tradition from the input of, 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 uh, of, of otherness. Now, of course, I would say there's one crucial problem with that, one crucial problem that we never, um, that, is, that, that is important for this part of the world, this strip of Western Europe to address, which is that, of course, that otherness is not something over there. <laughs> That otherness is right here in the core of us. In fact, that otherness is nothing, or we are nothing without that. So this idea that there's a Western tradition which we can simply defend and build a build a castle around it, and say that it runs from from Picasso to um, who would it be? Damien Hirst? I don't know. Um, that, that 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 it runs from that tradition is simply not possible here because there is no essential Europeanness which could be defended. That would be an obvious attack to it. But nevertheless, it's an option. It's a possibility. Even if you said, yes, we know that this city of Eindhoven is full of diversity, but we're talking to those people and giving people who are not within that Western tradition the chance to, to discover and see what the West once was. It's a possibility. The other possibility is the magician de la, de, de la Terre, which is to say, what the magician de la Terre said, it said basically that it's possible through an idea of individual genius to connect artists from parts of the world who have absolutely no historical connection with each other. So it dehistoricized. It was a dehistoricizing project. And that dehistoricizing project was based on the idea of the individual. So you could also go down that option. And both options today would be extremely problematic. So when we talk about the demodern, we have in that honest and I hope modest way to understand that we are providing a possibility amongst other possibilities which will need to be critiqued and demolished in the future, which will need to be taken apart. Again, there's a lot to say. Um, I think one, maybe one, maybe, maybe a concluding point would be good, no? Um, um, you see, I think if we say that the problem is our relation to communism, the problem comes back to how we relate to the period of the left, not when it was in power, not when the Bandung Conference proposed the possibilities of a third world, when Zhou Enlai was looking, was trying to build a separate kind of pole to the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union and uh, uh, the, 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 the more controlled socialist countries in Europe were also acting in the name of a progressive modern communism that we now see as problematic, when a country like Yugoslavia, before it broke up, was offering a particular, I sometimes think a very fruitful version of modernity in its work. Yeah, more fruitful often than the modernities of the West. It's not, that's not the problem. The problem for me, the problem about how do we release that communist promise, and I don't think we can call it communism anymore. Yeah, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think we can use those languages because of that history, but I think the essence of it is about social justice and equality. It's about things that we need to struggle for. To release that possibility of social justice and, and equality, again, is to understand what happened to the left after 1989 and to see that that is the problem that cannot be defended. What happened to the left after 1989 was that it destroyed itself, it ate itself. It ended up in a situation where the left, as much as the right, swallowed the idea that there is no alternative. You had the famous Tina, there is no alternative, which was begun in the 1980s by Margaret Thatcher, but really conquered the world. It has full spectrum coverage, yeah? economic, cultural, social, political, everything. Tina is everywhere. And Tina determines, with all the cynical responses that it generates, the idea of hopelessness, the idea of just looking after yourself, the idea of survival, all sorts of things. Tina generates, there is no alternative, generates the kind of impossibilities which modernity has got into. Precisely the need to demodernize is to address this question of there is no alternative and to find in other traditions. But also I would think if we can locate the modern, we can position it, we can place it, we can see it for what it is, also in the modern, to find the possibilities of emancipation that lie in all those traditions. 
and to allow them to develop in very different ways in different places, in different cultures, with different people. Always taking into account that Europe, and Rolando said it very nicely about the map, but you know, Europe isn't really a continent even. It's just an archipelago of Asia. I mean, the whole idea that there is a European culture is from a certain perspective, from the perspective of India, actually complete nonsense. Why is Jakarta and Vladivostok in the same continent and Paris isn't? Why? Tell me geographically why. It's a political decision. Europe is a political construct. And it's a political construct which is now so infused by that history of colonialism, which has meant that it's no longer the Europe that we fondly imagine comes from Greece and Rome. But it's a Europe which is completely changed from that, which has as much to do with Bamako or with Jakarta or with Suriname, I'm using the Dutch examples, but it could use any examples, as it does with ancient Greece or Athens. Probably far, far more to do with that. And creating that construct for this place, creating those relationships for this place, I think requires us to place the modern away from us. Not to, not to go back, not to ad address a kind of pre-modern idyll, which it certainly wasn't, nor to try and defend the terms of the BJP or Daesh or, or the Israeli right or whatever that are, that are anti-secular and anti-modern. This is not the exercise. It's, you know, it's, it's like, to say that is, to, is, to, is to, to say to a communist, yeah, but look at the gulags. It doesn't, it's irrelevant. Yeah? It has no use as a comment. It's pointless. But rather to do something else, which I think, I think fundamentally is, and this is maybe where the one time, I, I never use the word modernism, yeah, I absolutely avoid it. I talk about modernity, the modern, you notice that Rolando also didn't use the word modernism, but I don't think he did anyway. But uh, it's, it's not a, co a concept that we use, but maybe because we are in a modern museum, and because we have a modernist collection, maybe modernism, and I've just been thinking this, is maybe a useful term to use at this point, because that's what we can get distance from. If you, if you can't, and I understand it, because I struggle with it, if you can't see a way outside modernity, and Rolando said there were ways outside modernity, and I agree, agree with him, but it's damn hard to find them in Eindhoven. It's damn hard to find them in this culture, because it's, so, it's been so, the layers, the scalps are so thick. But maybe we can find a way outside of the modernism that we have in this space, and I think that's what an exhibition like Making of Modern Art does. It tries to place modernism within cadres, you know, what do you say, within confines, within the territory, imprison it. It tries to imprison, let's say that, imprison modernism in order to have the, the, the overview, yeah, to create, and I forgot the name of it, that prison where you have the complete overview. Panoptical. Panoptical, thank you very much. In order to create a panoptical in which we can see that modernism for what it is. Yeah? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm confused and I'm, I'm thinking about something else at the point um, <laughs> But at the same time, I think that that might be the gesture of the demodern that I would want to defend as a what if alongside other what ifs. Yeah? That's an easy get, get out, and I believe in the demodern. But I also I think just as decoloniality is presented as an option amongst others, some of which might be necessary, I think that for here and now, for this place, for Eindhoven, 2017, the demodern is a valid, valid option that I would want to defend against the idea of the modern as a continuing tradition. Thank you very much.